All right, and um, her wonderful, wonderful husband and partner in ministry, Pastor Andrew Wilkes. He is the principal of Wilkes Advo Advocacy Group. He's the co-lead pastor of the uh, Double Love Experience Church in Brooklyn that they just started. Um, also served as one of the youth and young adults and social justice uh, pastors for the Greater Allen AME Church. He has a MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary uh, and is considered one of uh, uh, New York's most important um, and wonderful leaders, all kind of accolades, distinguished leadership award, New York Theological Seminary Courage Award, Reverend Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push Advocacy Award, amen, Next Leader of the Future Award, amen. He's a writer and a speaker with The Guardian, Huffington Post, Sojourners, just an overall wonderful, wonderful dear brother. And uh, again, I'm just so grateful. He's in his fourth year of study in the PhD program in political science at the City University of New York Graduate Center. And uh, just very, very glad to have him here and them here. He is also, also the author of a book called Freedom Notes. And uh, in the second service, we'll get a chance to do a quick little interview with him about that. But I figure he can do his own little talk about it. Uh, as he gets ready to preach. Is that all right? Uh, so I am excited to have them. I think we all are going to be blessed today. So please stand to your feet, everyone, and let's prepare to welcome the spokesperson for the King of Glory today, Pastor Andrew Wilkes. <laughs> Put your hands together and give God some praise. Come on, the scriptures say, I will bless the Lord at all times. And God's praise shall not sometimes but continually be in my mouth. Come on, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt God's name together. Bless the Lord and forget not all of God's benefits. Who woke you up this morning? It wasn't the coffee, it wasn't the caffeine, but it was the goodness of the Lord that got you up out of bed this morning. And if you believe like I believe, just put your hands together one more time. And give a magnificent God a magnificent praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It, don't, it does not take much to push me into a point of ecstasy and giving the Lord praise because God's been good. Amen. Each of us, as we worship together, come with deeply personal and deeply individual reasons to bring our praise into a common pot of magnifying God. And it's a pleasure to be with you on this morning. Amen. I greet you all in the joy of Jesus the Christ. And in that joy, won't you help me celebrate your pastor, Pastor Mike McBride, come on. We are grateful for his ministry. We're grateful for Pastor Tanisha and Pastor Erna, Lady Sharice, uh, our dear, dear Hamptonian, Minister Lauren. Hey, glory, 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 glory. Grateful for the formation that happened in that collegiate season. And the Lord is still multiplying and compounding what happened in those times. You know, Hampton was a blessed place because that's also where I met my partner in life and in ministry. Won't you give God praise for Pastor Gabby Kudjo Wilkes? Hey, 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 hey. There's a blessing from the Mid-Atlantic that skips all the way over to the Bay Area. Glory, glory, glory. I, I, I love that we can have a mixture of, of levity and liturgy all together in the same spirit. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, won't you all turn with me uh, to the text for today, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, and while you're turning there, I just want to say a few words um, about uh, the book that Pastor Mike mentioned. Uh, it's called uh, Freedom Notes, uh, Reflections on Faith, Justice, and the Possibility of Democracy. Uh, how many folks know that democracy is more than just voting, more than jury service more than uh, the right to uh, petition the government for the redress of grievances, but democracy has to do with beloved community. Democracy has to do with genuine equality being something that we enjoy, right? So that people know they have a roof over their head, so that people can visit the doctor, so that folks can have reliable transportation, so that we can have justice in the air that we breathe, amen right in water that's reliable to drink and not what we've experienced in flint michigan amen and so we want to make sure that democracy is not just a possibility uh, but we want to push together to make sure it's an actuality something that marks our day-to-day -day, uh experience so i'm looking forward pastor mike to being in conversation with you uh at the 11 a.m hour there uh, if it's your custom won't you stand with me uh we'll be in first corinthians chapter 12 verses 4 through 7. when you get there say amen 
All right, that sounded like half the congregation. When you get there, say amen. amen. All right, it sounds like we're all there by app or by the book. Uh, well, they're both the book, you know, digitally or by parchment. Uh, let's read together. The text says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God. Somebody say, same God. Same God. Who activates all of them in everyone. And then here comes our focal verse. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Somebody say, for the common good. This is God's word for God's people. Somebody say, amen. amen. You can take your seats. Let's have a word of prayer. God, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence in whom we live, move, and have our very being. Be with us on this hour, God, that we might experience the joy that we need, the hope that we need, the transformation that we need. Accompany us in this preaching moment, God, that we might not only be hearers of your word, but being energized by the companionship of your word and your spirit, we might also be doers of your word. Let it be. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. 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 For the moments that are ours together during this 9 a.m. service, I want to talk from this theme. I have an endowment. Let's see if we can say that together one more time. Somebody say, I have an endowment. The spirit of the living God equips us with tremendous potential to do great things. And greatness is possible for all of us because greatness lies within each of us. Let me say that again. Greatness is possible for all of us because greatness is resident within and not a stranger to each of us. In spreading gifts, the spirit does not practice affirmative action for white men between the ages of 40 to 60 like our society sometimes does. But instead, the spirit of Christ distributes gifts to young and to old, to women and to men, to people of color and to white folks to college graduates and to GED recipients, to the well-employed and to the unemployed. Eternity equips everyone, somebody say everyone, everyone, with an endowment that enriches everybody else. What that means is the endowment that you have is not just for your own benefit, but it's for collective impact. The endowment that you have is not just for your private pleasure, but it's for a public advancement of the common good. Our text argues that the Holy Spirit manifests herself within each human being for the furtherance of the common good. What is the common good, you may inquire? The common good is a synonym for God's dream of all humanity. Walking with Paul in this Corinthian letter calls the more excellent way of love. The common good isn't a generic reference. The common good is not utopian speech that works in the sanctuary but not in society. The common good is an ideal whose realization points towards God's beloved community blooming within history, blooming within our midst. And there will never, beloved, be a eulogy of the common good in God's community. It may be ridiculed by those who trust in horses and in chariots. The common good may be opposed by Wall Street financiers and by increasing concentrations of wealth at the top of our economy. It may be exchanged for the me first, us last gospel, which is filling out American pulpits, but somebody knows that the common good of God will never be defeated, will never be ultimately downcast. The common good of God is working itself out and pushing its way through because there's a creation groaning, which needs to see the common good manifest in this age, in this hour, in this moment. The outworking of the common good in God's creation will take place because its origin and destiny it's not something we make up, but it's instead from everlasting to everlasting. And this morning, I want to celebrate the tradition uh, because it is Black History Month. Amen. 
I want to celebrate the tradition of black radical Christianity, which is a common good tradition invested in the care, survival, and freedom of black folks. And how many folks know that when we invest in the care, survival, and freedom of black folks, it has a reverberating effect for everybody else in society. If we can do right for black folk, that's the only condition in which we can do right for all folks. If we get black folks to have the rights that they ought to enjoy, both civilly and human rights, then we can be in a position where our universalism won't wing hollow. If we can do right for black folks, then we can get in a position where it won't be this insidious appeal to everyone because we don't want to deal with the particular injustices that black folks face. That's why we want to talk a little bit about black radical Christianity today. Is that all right? This is a particular kind of love that begins with black folk and then spirals out to other communities, other contexts, other cultures. I'm talking about clergy and laity, abolitionists like Harriet Tubman and Maria Stewart, preachers like Prathia Hall and Martin Luther King Jr., activists like Opal Tometi and Bree Newsom. We come, beloved, from a dark cloud of witnesses who have turned the world upside down for the common good of God's creation. And even though we live in an individualistic country, it's important to note that it takes a mixture. It takes a blend of individuals and institutions, of organizations and organizers to push forward the common good. I'm talking about Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois working through the NAACP. I'm talking about Nanny Helen Burroughs, who's pushing forward the National Baptist Convention. We're talking about Asa Philip Randolph working through the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. It does not take shooting stars, it takes a galaxy. It takes a constellation working together. Somebody shout together. To push, to prod, to provoke, to encourage, to equip, for the common good. And black institutions have always been at the center of black radical Christianity for the common good. They're not the circumference, but black institutions are the catalyzing center for our surviving and thriving. HBCUs still educate many of our black high school graduates. Historically, black denominations still nurture the majority of black Christians. Independent black politics, as represented by groups like the Black Alliance for Peace and the Movement for Black Lives, they still shine and outline a vision of the common good. And even though we don't have uh, as many uh, black periodical publications like the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender, black media is still, though bruised, yet unbowed. And it still publishes our news and our views. All of these institutions may not necessarily identify as Christian, uh, but they nevertheless push forward this mission and this mantra, this motif of the common good for all of God's creation. And what I want to say with particular power in the Bay Area is that I come to you in the spirit of Issa Rae. I'm rooting for everybody black. Oh yes, I come to you in the spirit of Issa Rae saying I'm rooting for everybody black. And I just want you to know that you ought to continue to serve the Lord with gladness. Continue to serve our people in a spirit of greatness because we need each other to ensure fair workplaces, to educate our kids, to heal our sick, to provide legal representation. I'm rooting for everybody black and I believe that God is rooting for everybody black because our liberation is a hinge point, is the fulcrum for the liberation of all people. Not just a few kinds of black people not just the respectable cohort of black people, but all kinds of black people. And when all of us get free, the size of a groaning and uh, weary and heavy laden creation will be relieved and the common good of all who are made, somebody say, just a little lower than the angels, their common good will be advanced. I wanna be careful here because I don't want to celebrate black radical Christianity in a way that diminishes and devalues our own potential for greatness. Are, are you with me? I, I don't want to celebrate the greatness of our tradition in a way that makes our own genius, our own power, our own possibilities invisible and inaudible. Celebration of greatness is meant to awaken us to our own inherent greatness. Celebration of the ancestor that has come before is meant to introduce us and to reacquaint us with what we may have forgotten about ourselves. The purpose of talking about a lineage is to recognize that it doesn't preclude you, it includes you. 
And what that means is that we have the same power, we have the same purpose, we have the same possibilities as all of the luminaries that we celebrate. In other words, there's greatness in you. There's genius in you. And when you look at problems, look to yourself to be a solution. When you look at challenges, look to yourself to be a challenge solver. When you see conditions that seem to be Goliaths, recognize that you have a Davidic spirit within you. You can face down the giant. You have a Deborah spirit within you. You can face down the obstacles and judge the conditions of the people rightly. We do not have to be intimidated by the enormity of the injustices that we face. The promise of black radical Christianity is that even when you're in a hush harbor in the low country of the southeastern United States, you can redeem a religion, as Howard Thurman says, that was profaned in your midst. The genius of black radical Christianity is that you can push for womanism in the soul of a community and hit a straight lip with a crooked stick, even when you don't have all the resources. God has the imagination. God has the ingenuity to use your teamwork to use your coordination, to use your collaboration, to make sure that public school is the place where our kids can learn, Amen. to make sure that our housing systems actually provide decent housing, whether that's supportive housing, public housing, rental housing, or affordable home ownership. What I'm simply trying to say is that we are the ones that we've been waiting for because when we're accompanied by the spirit of the living God, we have what it takes. Somebody shout, we have, we have. what it takes. Somebody shout, we have what it takes. Different gifts, but the same spirit. An appropriate way to celebrate black radical Christianity is to apply these collective gifts to our common problems today. Together, beloved, we can build what Dr. King in his last published work, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, and that last work, he said that we can build a world house by opposing America's militarism, materialism, and racism uh, in the name of higher ideals like equal justice under the law and participatory democracy and the inherent genius and dignity of all people. Greatness then, greatness which we celebrate is meant to energize us to do great works and great exploits for God right now. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. Let's pivot and lean into the text to see what Paul has to say about guidelines on using our gifts for the common good. Now, Corinth, uh, which is the city that is inferred by the letter of 1 Corinthians, it was an affluent port city. Uh, you might say it was a Bay Area of sorts that had a noble legacy uh, that experienced uh, fissures and deep stratification between those who are affluent and those who are disinherited, uh, between the rich and the poor. And it was known for its culture throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, Y'all don't mind if I just teach a little bit, do you? During the first city, the Greco-Roman culture of Hellenism dominated the outlook of the elites and of everyday folks. And Hellenistic culture was based on a plethora of human hierarchies. In essence, it assumed that there was one fixed, permanent, effectively eternal station for the rich and another station for those who are poor and marginalized. But in the church, somebody say in the church, God's beloved community seeks to invert the order of status-driven, power-obsessed, wealth-fixated society. In God's beloved community, advancing the common good means building up the entire body of Christ. And God's beloved community. Furthering the common good is about a radical welcome for all God's people. Somebody say all God's people. In chapter 12, Paul rhapsodizes about the church as the body of Christ. And he says that uh, the body not only needs the head and the eyes, but it also needs the feet, the hands, and so on. Uh, when I was a young boy growing up in church, I used to love to hear the Baptist preachers uh, uh, talk poetically about how God not only needs uh, uh, your, your collarbone, but God also needs the backbone, right? God not only needs your knees, but God also needs uh, the bones in your foot. And you would hear all these uh, uh, anatomy references, and sometimes they didn't all make sense. But the point, <laughs> the point is that God needs every muscle, every fiber, every nerve, every tissue in the entire body in order to push forward what is of public significance, in order to push forward the common good. How do members advance the common good, Paul? 
through spiritual gifts which are given to us by grace. Somebody say by grace. By grace. Through the Spirit of Christ. Verses 4 through 10 indicate that the Holy Spirit distributes an assortment of gifts to believers. In our selected passages, we discover that wisdom and healing, faith and discernment are gifts, are philanthropic uh, distributions of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in addition to the list that we find in 1 Corinthians, Romans chapter 12 also outlines a broader inventory of spiritual gifts where leading, where leadership and teaching, for instance, are a part of the gifts that God gives to us. And walk closely with me here, beloved. Because our gifts are different and distinct, the spiritual challenge is to avoid thinking that some gifts have more value than others. Because our gifts are different and distinct and disparate, the spiritual challenge is to avoid making a vicious dichotomy and bifurcation and a totem pole kind of relationship between some gifts and other gifts. For instance, our culture conditions us to celebrate charismatic leadership more than collaborative leadership. And even though it's important to have a spark of magnetism that cannot cause us, ought not cause us, to overlook the power of bringing folks together and leading by consensus as well as leading by charisma. Somebody say we need both. We need them all. We need both. We need them all. Through church banquets and community awards, uh, sometimes we get the idea, I'm speaking about the church universal, not this beloved church. We get the idea that preaching and music ministries are significant in a way that we don't always associate with outreach and justice ministries. But our opportunity this morning is to understand that your gift, that my gift, that every gift is valuable, is sacred, is significant, is important, has import. It, it carries weight and gravitas, not only in our eyes, but in the eyes of God who endowed you with the gift in the first place. And if this is true, if this is true, let's go further. Every gift is precious. Why? Because it stems from the spirit of God. And when we accept this as true, two things follow. First, our gifts deserve appropriate recognition. Somebody say appropriate recognition. Because our gifts matter, they deserve to be recognized with a thank you for completed volunteer assignments, a paycheck for work performed, and a labor union to defend your well-being on the job. Appropriate recognition for your gifts enables us to care from a sustainable place and from a protected place as we push for the common good. I don't have to bear witness this morning, but I just might bear witness this morning. Uh, that some of us have testimonies that while you were pushing for the common good, somewhere along the way you got mishandled. Somewhere along the way you might have been exploited. Somewhere along the way you might have been mistreated. And so it's important to insist on appropriate recognition for your gifts. And when we talk about insisting on appropriate recognition, that's not an individual matter because sometimes we need the brothers to insist on appropriate recognition for the sisters. And sometimes the brothers need to be vulnerable and accept that a sister can insist on appropriate recognition for your gift and you don't have to be too uh, uh, mesmerized by conquistador masculinity or toxic masculinity to receive the help and support of a sister. What I'm saying is that if we have a mutual spirit of care, we can all have appropriate recognition for our gifts. Am I talking right this morning? Secondly, secondly, your gift is a reflection of its source, who is the Holy Spirit. And when your gift contributes to the common good, your life becomes a looking glass which reveals the energy and the power of the Holy Spirit. The foundation of the common good, beloved, again, is not a vague spirit of teamwork, but the foundation of the common good consists of spirit-filled human beings tilting this present age towards God's beloved community. The foundation of the common good is us coming together with, with what we might mistakenly perceive as ordinary gifts and watch God take those seemingly ordinary gifts and do an extraordinary thing in our midst. The foundation of the common good is us recognizing that what we think is of minimum importance can make a maximum impact when God is in the room. Am I talking to anybody this morning? The foundation of the common good is recognizing that when we do spirit-filled work, God has a way of magnifying what we take to be little 
and to make much out of what we put into the earth. And so whether your gift envisions or executes the idea, it's valuable when it advances the common good. Whether your gift has you standing on your feet all day, sitting in front of a computer, or making deals around the table, your gift has weight, it has import. And Dr. King recognized this truth when he said that change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but it comes instead through the tireless exertions of those who are committed to right. In other words, when we use our gifts to advance the common good in the way that Paul talks about, in the way that King mentions, in the way that Prathia Hall mentions, in the way that Ella Jo Baker certainly taught us to do, our gifts have a way of coming together and our participation has a way of uh, of, of causing results that we could not forecast, of causing outcomes that we could not anticipate a priori. God has a way, in other words, of making your ladder better than what you presume in the former days when you just put your hand to the plow and start to work. Our communities move from common problems to the common good when we employ our gifts together for God's beloved community. And I'm told that there's a strike underway in Oakland. And what we know is that across this country, from Kentucky to Oklahoma, uh, from West Virginia to even further south in Los Angeles, when teachers successfully stand up for the common good of our students, come on, put your hands together for that, our students, our community, and our democracy, we can see change be realized. And the recovery of the power of the strike and the work of walkout is a important negotiating tactic to make sure that our gifts have due recognition and to make sure that we can push forward to make sure that public education is not an empty right, but that it is instead uh, uh, an experience that prepares our children to be college ready or to be vocational school ready, to be uh, 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 ready for community and to be ready for civic engagement. We need to affirm and to applaud the, uh, 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 the conduct of a strike when what it does is to promote justice for our students, for our schools. Can somebody say amen? Let me give you another example of the common good. Standing for the common good is 13,000 donors giving over $2 million in just two months to Bennett College. We're talking about an HBCU that is dedicated to the education of black women, which was teetering on whether or not it would lose its accreditation. And churches came together, and foundations came together, and fraternities came together, and sororities came together, and individuals came together. And we put all of our coins and whatever we had to put them in, reached down in our pockets, reached down in our purse, reached down in the knapsack, reached underneath the mattress, whatever you had to get to support the education of our black children and our black young adults, that happened. And Bennett College was able to exceed their fundraising targets by a wide margin. Oh yeah, we can put our hands together for that. And, and many of us may have been watching the news and, and we may have been uh, dismayed when we saw that after raising nearly $10 million, Bennett College still was in a situation where they saw their accreditation pool. But what happened is that the day didn't end like the day started. Amen. Because some lawyers got together and they said, we will appeal this unjust condition. Amen. And they got a federal court in Atlanta to restore temporarily their accreditation status. What I'm trying to say is that when the people gave, that was a victory. And when the lawyers did their work, that was a victory. Amen. And when we can apply all of our expertise, all of our gifts, all of our aptitudes, all of our abilities, we can secure the outcomes that God wants us to have. The common good vision of our text should provoke us to examine ourselves. Does our vision of the common good include folks who don't look like us, love like us, vote like us, pray like us? Is our God concerned about the common good of those we presume to be our enemies, our detractors, and our opponents? I want you to sit with the questions this morning. Does our vision of the common good extend to those whom we resent right before we pray our prayers? Does our vision of the common good cut so deep? Is it so robust that we have it even for those who may have justly, uh, 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 who, who may not justly have a claim on our compassion, but nevertheless, we regard them with respect because somewhere the Savior told us to love our enemies. I'm not saying let folks walk all over you, but I'm saying does your vision of the common good recognize that God has a plan and purpose for their lives, 
even if that plan and purpose and your own care means that they walk on a path away from yours, right, right? You, you may not need to walk along the same path, but, but can you pray in such a way that you recognize that God's not through with them either? That we don't serve a throwaway God. That we don't serve a God of punitive punishment justice, but we serve a God of somebody shout restorative justice. Our vision of the common good means we have to recognize that God is into restoring and repairing and reconciling that which we sometimes push away, throw away, and cast away. God is committed to pushing for a non-exclusive vision of the common good. That means everybody's in. Everybody's in. And as a preacher, I have to give it to you straight as I get ready to take my seat. We face enormous challenges to the common good. We live in a moment where the ideal of mutual destiny is widely seen as an irrelevant imposition on the individual pursuit of dollars, dreams, and private delight. I understand that the saints need to get their coins. Believe me, I understand. Especially when Sally Mae comes knocking and you don't want Sally to knock and you don't really want to answer. I understand that the saints need to get their coins. But if we don't believe that our futures overlap, and if... I isolate my freedom from your freedom. Working from, for the common good is an impossible undertaking. If we don't believe that uh, injustice anywhere is actually a threat to justice everywhere, uh, then we can't work for the common good. If we don't believe, as the old uh, laborers used to say, that an injury to anybody is an injury to everybody, we can't work for the common good. But if you sense that we have the capacity to insist on an indivisible, intersectional and insurgent vision of the common good. It may be that we not only have troubles to bemoan, but we have help on the way. If you believe that we not only need to recognize our own power, but to recognize our power tethered together in community and tethered further in communion with God, then it might be that we have help on the way. If you believe that we do not labor alone, but we labor accompanied by a God who's more than able, to do exceedingly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine. It may be that we have help on the way. If you sense that God is not a sometimes present or a partially present, but I read somewhere that he's a very present help in the time of trouble. If you believe that God is able, I stop by to let you know that there's power to deal with the common good. There's strength to deal with the common good. For every lion's den, there's a God who will help you in the fire. For every Pharaoh, there's a Miriam and a Moses working for liberation. For every crucifixion, there's a God pulling Jesus off the cross. What I want you to know this morning is that if you sense a common malady, God has a common good. If you sense a common dilemma, God has a common deliverance. If you sense a common setback, God can give you a common bounce back. If you sense a common pushing down, God can do a common pulling up. If you sense that you've been cast out, struck down, you're not destroyed. You may be driven out, but not in despair. I just want somebody to know that for every moment when you feel discouraged, abandoned, let alone, God is always pulling you back and whispering that if you do not isolate yourself, but instead immerse yourself in the wonderful waters of community. God can take your gift and multiply it. God can take your genius and amplify it. God can take what you put into the basket and give out more than two fish, more than five loaves, but God can feed those who are dealing with food insecurity. If you give God what you have, God will take what you have and do the kind of magnificent multiplication that is why we call God divine in the first place. In other words, when what you input comes out with more in terms of the output, you know that God is at work. And what I simply want to leave you with is the uh, brief little story that lets you know that we walk differently when we have an endowment. About 10 years ago, I was a student at uh, Princeton Seminary, and while I was a student, you can take your seats. While I was a student, we went through a great recession. Anybody remember that? Around 2008. And when we went through the great recession, 
Uh, it was a difficult time for a number of seminaries. Uh, many folks in the room who have gone to seminaries or to colleges or community colleges can attest that the Great Recession uh, was, was trying to take everybody's coins, yes? Uh, but, but one of the things that I noticed is that uh, Princeton was able to navigate that moment a little bit differently uh, because Princeton had an endowment of about a billion dollars. And because it had an endowment, it was able to move through the calamity. It was able to move through the catastrophe. It was able to move through the volatilities of an uncertain, unreliable, unfriendly market because there was something stored away. And what I want you to know is that this is not only true of, of elite white institutions, but you also have an endowment. You also have heavenly help that is of historical availability. You also have, you, you have a God who is not impacted by all of the austerity and the anti-abundant thought that floods our culture. God has more than enough resources to help you do what you are assigned to do. You can walk tall. You can stretch out your shoulders. You can look people in the eye, even if you don't come from what they come from. Because you have an endowment. You are connected to greatness. You are connected to ingenuity that can make something great, even if what you see when you look around yourself appears to be meager. And when you know you have an endowment, hear me, you can be strong and courageous. When you know you have an endowment, you won't see yourself as a grasshopper but you can see yourself as somebody who can walk into the land and do what needs to be done. Yeah. Beloved, I just want you to put your hands on your head and say with me, I have, I have an, endowment. an endowment. Say it with me one more time. I have, I have an, endowment. an endowment. And picture the scenario where you last felt like you were inadequate, like you were unequal to whatever responsibility was placed before you. Picture a scenario where you thought that you were somewhat competent, but not measuring up with everyone else in the room. And won't you just speak over your own life. I have, I have an, endowment. an endowment. God bless you. Put your hands together and give God some praise. Hallelujah. Come on, grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind.